nothing elaborate, nothing fancy, not a big, you know, carefully prepared sermon. Just a very simple word of exhortation. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. And we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. <clears throat> the King James reads in this fashion, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least <coughs> commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard it said, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask, Lord, now that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would assist us at this hour, God, to deliver this simple word of exhortation from your word. Help us, God, to be encouraged and help. Lord, there's nothing that I could possibly say at this moment in time in and of myself that could be of any help to anyone. But, Lord, we need your assistance. We need your guidance. We need the enlightenment of the Holy Ghost. Grant it this hour, we pray, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. When you read uh, what the Lord is saying here in Matthew chapter 5, and if you read the whole chapter, and it is a rather long chapter, and that's why I had to pick a portion of the chapter out that I thought I would use tonight. But if you were to read the entire chapter that we're looking at this evening, then you would understand that the Lord was trying to help the Hebrew people understand that with the arrival of the kingdom of heaven, there was a change in the protocol. There was a change in the way that things were being done. You'll notice that in much of what he is saying here, he said, you have heard, you have heard that it was said of them of old, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, that there's a change in protocol. There's a change in the way things are done. When the kingdom of heaven comes on the scene, things are done differently. You see, the law was accustomed to looking at uh, 
humanity based upon that which we did. He said, you have heard it said, of old, by them of old, thou shalt not kill. So the law was focused on what you did. And what you did was, you, if you killed, you had broken the law. And the Lord said, but no. He said, listen, except your righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. Because true righteousness is not about preventing yourself from doing a bad act. See, that, that's what a lot of people spend their time focusing on, trying to prevent themselves from doing the wrong thing or a bad thing. But the Lord said, for those, uh, he said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. So the Lord said, no. He said, the kingdom of heaven goes beyond the act, and it goes to the heart of the matter. Amen. If I were to put a title on tonight's message, it would be Matters of the Heart. Because God, the Bible tells us plainly as the Lord uh, had the great priest and prophet and uh, judge over Israel looking at the sons of Jesse. And he looked at one after another and he thought, yes, this would make a good king. This must be the one God wants to anoint. Yes, this one would make a good king. This must be the one God wants to anoint. Yes, this would make a good king. This must be the one. And each and every time the Holy Spirit of God is saying, no, that's not the one. No, that's not the one. No, that's not the one. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. All of a sudden, here comes a little skinny, scrawny shepherd boy from the field with a slingshot hanging out of his pocket. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks to old Samuel and says, that's the one. Yeah. Amen. Because sometimes the most unlikely figures are the ones that God will use the greatest. And David proved to be one of the greatest men of God that ever walked the face of this planet. Was he a perfect man? No. But he was a man after God's own heart. Which meant that David's heart was always in the right place. His feet may not have been. <laughs> His hands may not have been. His head may not have been. His manly parts may not have been. But his heart was always, without exception, in the right place. And you see, there's a lesson in that for us as children of God. With the arrival of the kingdom of God, uh, matters become not so much matters of law, but matters of the heart. God wants us to be certain that at every time, in every situation, that we're able to keep our heart pure and right before him and keep our heart in the right place. Amen? Amen. Amen. You see, there may be, uh, there are times you feel like you might want to choke somebody. Somebody does you dirty. I know in the last couple of years here, our church has been through some situations where I've about wanted to choke some people. But there's something inside of me that says, not only would it not be appropriate to choke that person, but it's not appropriate to allow yourself to feel this way. It's not appropriate to allow yourself to uh, sit here and uh, fester these thoughts and allow these thoughts to fester inside of you. It's not appropriate. It's not good. Because if you let it start on the inside, before too long it will manifest itself on the outside. And that's what the Lord was telling his people as he was speaking to them in Matthew 5. He was saying, whoever's angry without, and when his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Why? Because God knows. That if we let it start out small on the inside, before too long, it'll be big on the outside. It'll turn into a mess in the real world. So the Lord was helping the people to understand that with the arrival of the kingdom of God, we're going to deal with matters when they're still in the heart. 
before they have a chance to even manifest themselves outwardly, before they even have a chance to manifest themselves in actions or in conduct or in behavior. God is going to help us to deal with these matters while they're still matters of the heart. Because if we can learn to deal with these matters while they're still matters of the heart. Look at, we just heard tonight talking earlier about Dolly Parton yeah. and her experience with Porta Wagner mm -hmm. and how this little lady, bless her heart, was sued for all that money. Mm -hmm. And then later in life when Porta Wagner wanted to buy songs from her that they had sung together and made so much, uh, made popular and made so much money. And she said, tell you what, I'll give them to you. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because there was something in little Dolly, bless her heart. Mm -hmm. There's no sense in holding grudges. It's only money. Mm -hmm. It's only money. He sued me. He won. The judge must have thought that I owed it. So obviously, it's only money. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Instead of letting something fester in my heart, instead of letting something little on the inside turn into something big on the outside, I'm just going to nip it in the bud. Amen. And I'm going to make sure that it doesn't become anything greater. Amen. You know, it's amazing when we see sometimes, the Lord said, anyone who is angry with his brother without a cause. How many times have we seen on television where somebody has murdered another individual, and then when we hear the reason for that murder, yeah. we're thinking to ourselves, how stupid. Yes, that's right. Well, he looked at my girlfriend. Well, he said something to my boyfriend, or she did this, or he did that. And we're thinking to ourselves, well, that, that explanation is ridiculous. That's right. Nobody should die for that. But you see, it starts mm -hmm. in the matters of the heart. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the problem with some of these folks is they already had so much anger on the inside that it doesn't right. take much mm -hmm. to bring it out. Amen? That's why God wants the love of God. That's why he says, love your neighbors and love your enemies. Oh, my Lord, what do you mean, Lord? Every time we hear that, we think to ourselves, love your enemies. What is God crazy to say <laughs> love your enemies? But you see, there's a reason for that. That's right. Mm -hmm. The Lord is saying, because if you let anger and malice and bitterness take a hold, then it's not going to take much to bring all that anger and malice and bitterness out. And you're going to find yourself doing things that you wouldn't want to do. You're going to find yourself doing things that you'd regret. You're going to find yourself doing things that are going to land you in prison. And instead of having a good life, and instead of leading a good life, you wind up spending the rest of your life in jail, rotting away in a prison cell. How many young people there are in our world today that haven't even lived yet 15 or 16 years and they've got so much bitterness and so much negativity and so much anger built up inside of them that they're harboring in their heart. Right. And what they need to understand is, sweetheart, let Jesus in. That's right. Because Jesus will help you to love the most unlovable. He'll help you to love the one that does you dirty just as much as to love the one who does you well. He'll help you to be able to approach people calmly and coolly and, and to be able to keep your temper and not become angry and upset and possibly do something that you would never have wanted to do in the first place. Why? Because God deals first with the matters of the heart. This is where he starts. This is where God starts. You know, we love sometimes to point to the scripture that says God looks on the heart and man looks on the outward appearance. And we love to kind of look at that and almost explain away our actions and our conduct and our behavior. But that's not what it's meant to do. What it's meant to do is help us to focus on what's important. Amen. Which is the heart. And help us to focus on that's what we've got to try to keep in the right place and in the right frame of mind at all times is the matters of the heart. Let's keep that heart in the right place. Amen. The Word of God tells us in Psalm 51 and verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You see, God's desire for truth is in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, he will make us to know wisdom. God wants wisdom and truth to be a part of 
the matters of the heart. He wants that to be a part of our internal being. He wants that to be a part of our internal makeup. Not just something we're aware of at an external cognitive level, but something that literally is a part of the framework of our being. You know, it's funny because in Matthew chapter 5, the same chapter that we read tonight, just before I began to read this evening at verses 17 through verse 30, just before I read that, the Lord had said in verses 14 through 16, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give up light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the very next verse, after he says all this about being the light of the world, uh, after talking about letting our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Right after this, the Lord began with, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then he begins to explain some of the points of law. And he begins to explain that what's important is that you be first motivated right that your heart be right. Because if your heart's right, then your behavior will follow. If your heart's right, then your conduct will follow. Amen. He's, he's saying, I want you to let your light shine before men. But if you're going to be able to do this, then you're going to have to understand the protocol. You're going to have to understand what's important first. And what's first important is, not so much what you do, but why you're doing it. And if you'll focus on the internal, if you'll focus on the matters of the heart rather than the matters of the head. You know, a lot of people spend all their life trying to live out of their head. Yeah. Amen. Rather than out of their heart. Yeah. And the Lord said, no, no. You've got to allow the matters of the heart to reign supreme in your life. You've got to get that heart changed. Look in Psalm 51, 7 through 11, what the, the great David, the psalmist said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. What's David saying there? He's saying, when you have corrected me, when you have had to stop me in my tracks and make me realize that I was making the error of my way, in that correction, in that instruction, help me to hear joy and gladness. Help me to be glad for instruction. Help me to be glad for your correction. The Bible said that if God didn't correct us, we'd be bastards. That's what the Bible says says, because only a child that has no father goes without any correction or instruction in their lives. said, but if you have a heavenly father, and if God is indeed your heavenly father, then you can expect him to correct you at times. And this is why David Roman said, help me, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. But now listen to this. We've heard this verse many times in our lives. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, because that is where it all begins. And David knew it. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. Because if ever I have any hope of doing right, I first have to have gotten the matters of the heart in place. I have got to have gotten the matters of the heart lined up. Amen? Amen? 
Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I don't think there's a worse place in the world that a person, I don't think there's a worse experience in the world that we can have than feeling like God is not near us. And we don't feel God near us. I think that's probably one of the most horrific feelings. I know for myself personally, when I spent that time in the hospital almost five years ago now, I felt like God was a million miles away. I really did. I could not feel God. I, I, whether it was the drugs or whether it was uh, the surroundings, I don't know. But whatever it was, I could not feel God for all the money in the world. And I remember laying in that hospital bed and I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, I believe you're here. I don't feel you. I don't sense you. But I believe you're here. Why do I believe you're here? Because you said you'd be here. And you're not a liar. And whether I feel you or I don't feel you, I'm going to believe that you're here for me. Well, honey, I'm here tonight. And that's proof that he was there for me. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is nothing worse than feeling like God is so far from you that you just cannot even... Tune in to him and feel him anywhere near you. But there's only one way to keep God close. And David said it. Create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. God is not close to people who draw close to him with their lips. Many people go to church every Sunday and they sit in the pew and they say amen. And, and they go through the motions and they sing the songs and they listen to the preacher preach. But the Bible said, they draw nigh unto me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, you don't get close to God by verbalizing. You don't get close to God by doing the right things. No, you get close to God by getting your heart in alignment. You get close to God by, by setting the matters of the heart in order. And it's when our heart is in order that we'll feel the Lord close to us. That's why when you can be driving down the street and listening to some gospel music and tears are streaming down your face as they're singing certain songs because your heart is just right in alignment and you're feeling what they're singing. Amen. It's not just a Sunday morning experience. It's a Monday through Saturday experience as well. Amen. And your heart is there. Your heart is lined up. Your heart is in tune. And that song plucks your heartstrings. Isn't it funny how you can cry like a baby when you break up with somebody in a relationship. And all of a sudden a song comes on the radio that, oh, it just, it just plucks your heartstrings. Oh, all of a sudden you just start bawling. There you come again. <laughs> or old Gloria Gaynor, I will survive, I will survive, just as long as I know how to love, I know I'll be alive. Yeah, and oh boy, and all of a sudden our old heart starts kicking in, and woo, yeah, we're feeling it. We're feeling it. But you see, that's where your heart's at. You, that song is touching your heart. It's not touching you physically, yeah. but it's touching you emotionally. Yeah. You're really right. you're really in tune with what that person is saying in that yeah. song. That's right. Yeah. And that's why the Christian experience has got to be an experience of the heart. It can't be an experience of, well, I go to church every Sunday and I sing the songs and I read this and I, I listen to that and blah, blah, blah. No, it's got to be a matter of the heart. Amen. Because in the end, God isn't seeing whether you go to church on Sunday. That's right. Amen. That's right. There's a lot of people today can't be in church. I know there were there were weeks and weeks and weeks when I couldn't be in church because I was in a hospital and all That's that. Right. You think because I couldn't go to church that the Lord would hold that against me? Of course not. That's right. yes. Because in the kingdom of God, it's the matters of the heart. Amen. God knew my heart was there. Amen. He knew if I'd have had any chance in the world, if there was any any opportunity in the world, I'd have been there. But I couldn't be there. 
But then there are those that come, and you know what? Their heart isn't here. Amen. Their heart is way off, and let's see, it's over there at, at Six Flags, and it's over there at Denny's, and it's over there at home. It's doing laundry. It's folding laundry. That's where their heart is, but they're sitting here. Amen. That's right. And they think, well, you know, God's going to usher me into heaven, and bless God, I'm going to get a key to, to heaven and a great big ceremony because I went to church every Sunday and sat through Charles preaching, bless God, and if that ain't enough to be rewarded, I don't know what is. <laughs> but you know what? While you thought you was fooling everybody, while you thought everybody was fool, God wasn't the least bit fooled. He knew every motivation that was going on in your heart. He knew everything that motivated you and moved you. And you know, that's true. That's not just true for you as, as parishioners. I hate to use that term, but for, for people in the pew, it's also true of the preacher. There's a lot of preachers get up every Sunday and preach. And you know what? They're not preaching because they love God. They're not preaching because they love the people of God. They're not preaching because they want to get closer to God or they want to help the people of God get closer to God. They're preaching to get their paycheck. Amen. That's right. And they think that God doesn't see that. They think that God isn't aware. They think that God is foolish and somehow he's fooled by their trickery. But the reality is God knows exactly what's going on because the only part of your entire being that the Lord focuses on yes, is amen. your heart. Yes. When your body's in church, if your heart isn't in church, then guess what? God yes. sees where your heart is. That's right. Amen. 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 Isn't that something? Yes. Your body can be in church and guess what? The Lord ain't looking at your body. He's looking at your heart and it's over there watching that show you wanted to see on, on channel 11. It's over there watching that DVD. Because God knows where your heart is. And your heart and your spiritual man are one and the same. Because your heart is, not your physical heart obviously, we know that that doesn't feel anything, it does, but, but the heart that God is speaking of, that's why David the psalmist said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Because the two are married. The two are one and the same. If your spiritual man is going to be right, then your heart's got to be right. And if your heart is right, then your spiritual man is right. And y'all heard me talk about the fact that man is comprised of three elements, yes. body, soul, and spirit. Amen. And it's funny because sometimes we're here in church in body, yes. mm -hmm. That's right. and we're here in soul. You know why I know you're here in soul? Because if you wasn't, you'd be dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your body and soul are here. But your spiritual man is out there wandering through the lily somewhere, just <laughs> enjoying the good weather. <laughs> Amen. It's called matters of the heart. And the Lord spoke in Matthew chapter 5 about points of the law. And then he said, you know, you've heard it said this way. But I'm telling you today that it's differently in the kingdom of God. We approach things differently because we're not looking at the action. We're concerned with the heart. If we can keep the heart in the right place, then the actions will follow. Amen? Amen. And I want you to know tonight, <sighs> the Lord talked about as an example, I'm, I'm almost closing actually, not only did he talk about murdering and then he talked about well no it's not just murder it's about having ought against your brother unnecessarily being angry with your brother for no reason but then he also goes on to talk about if you bring your gift to the altar if you're bringing something to the house of god with the intent of giving it to god he said, but in the process of that, you realize that your brother has ought against you. He said, you know what? 
leave your gift before the altar, turn around, and go make up with your brother. Because the best gift you can bring God is to have the right heart. He said, so while you're bringing the money, while you're bringing the offering, and you're thinking, woo, I'm going to help the church out because i got $5,000 I can give. But you got all kinds of hell busting loose in your family, and you got all kinds of trouble with other people in the community. Mm -hmm. And God said, no, I don't want your money. Leave your money there. Go fix that other first so that when you come, you're coming from the right place. That's right. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. And that's what the Lord's talking about. Because the kingdom of heaven isn't about actions. Your five grand ain't going to buy you a ticket into heaven. Amen. Amen. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. That's right. One of the greatest things I've ever seen in church services. And I love to see stuff like this. I, and I have seen it many times. Is when you know that there are people in the church that have a little kind of a problem with one another for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit of the Lord gets to move it in the church. <laughs> and we're having one of them good shouting services and the Holy Ghost is moving. And all of a sudden, Sister Jones over here has to make her way to Sister Smith over here. That's right, amen. Because she won't feel right leaving that service right. Amen. with God having been there in such a beautiful way. She won't feel right leaving that service Amen. until she's made up with that lady. That's right. Amen. And I've seen it many, many times. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it in foot washing services. Okay. See, that's something we believe in is foot washing. A lot of churches don't believe in foot washing. Yeah. We do. Absolutely I do. Jesus said... That he had shown us these things as an example. He said, happy are ye if you do them. So therefore, I believe that foot washing is every bit as important a, an element in the church as communion is. And I've seen foot washing services where individuals have just broke down and started crying and hugging on one another because they had ought against one another. But in the process of the act of of humbling yourself in front of your brother or in front of your sister all of a sudden they just realized how stupid is this my 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 bad feelings are for nothing that's right they really don't amount to anything yeah. i'm supposed to love this person and you know what i do love this person because right. deep down in my heart I really do love this person. That's right. And whatever it is the devil's trying to drive between us, that's exactly what it is, the devil. That's right. And I'm not going to let the devil drive something between that person and I. Amen. And you see, that's one of the wonderful things that uh, I love about the move of God's Spirit because God motivates people, you know, sometimes Amen. to make it right. I've had people come to me and apologize to me for things. And I've gone to people and apologized to them for things. Mm -hmm. I remember when I started my first church. I was 18 years old, just a kid. Thought I knew everything. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I was terrified at the weight of the responsibility of pastoring. Yeah. Because pastoring to me was a huge responsibility and I mm -hmm. never wanted to take it lightly. I still don't. Amen. And I remember calling a former pastor of mine, John Harmon, down in New Jersey where he was pastoring at that time. I don't know if he's still there or not, but he was at that time. Mm -hmm. And I called Brother Harmon on the phone. And I said, Brother Harmon, I'm about to have the first services in my church here were starting a church in Seymour. He said, well, Chuck, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. He said, I knew you were heading in that direction, you know. I said, but Brother Harmon, you know what? I said things when you were my pastor that I shouldn't have said. I was critical of you, and I was judgmental of you, and I, I, I you know, thought I knew better than you, and he said, Chuck, you never caused me any trouble. That's what Brother Harmon told me. He said, I don't remember you ever causing me any trouble. And I said, Brother Harmon, if I want to get my heart right, mm -hmm. then I've got to confess it to you. You may never have been aware. 
It may never have caused you a day's grief, but you know what? It was still wrong mm -hmm. because it was starting from here. Right. And I had no right second-guessing my pastor, criticizing my pastor, judging my pastor. I had no right to do that. That was wrong. Yeah. That man was there by God's, uh, by God's appointment and God's calling. I had no business second-guessing him. And if I'm going to start pastoring the church tomorrow, I don't want to go into that church right. with that track record behind me. That's right. Because mm -hmm. guess what? You reap what you sow. That's right. Amen. It comes around. Yes, yes sir. That's right. And I said, brother, I know you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. So I'm repenting of it before I ever even get out there because I don't want to have a church full of people like that. That's right. Who are constantly second guessing me and judging me and criticizing me and condemning me for every decision I ever make along the way. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm trying to say? Yes, amen. Because it's about the matters of the heart. That's where it starts. If we got to fix it, you got to fix it there first. And if we fix it there first, then everything else will just fall into place. All the externals, all the outward uh, relationships, all the outward. Uh, actions will all fall into place and they'll, they'll be the right actions and they'll be the right relationships and we'll approach things the right way if first we deal with the matters of the heart. Make any sense? Yes, Just a little word of encouragement tonight. I know it's not any big fancy sermon but it's the best I could do this week I'm afraid. Yes, it's kind of been a little bit of a discouraging week, but I sure did appreciate the ladies in North Dakota sending us an offering. You know, it's not about the amount, but see again, it's just the fact that they were willing to try to help. Amen. Right. That means so much to me, you know. Amen. if Do you realize that if, if five or six people would just feel the way they did, yes, that our needs could be met amen. in their entirety, you know. And it, it, it doesn't take a lot from, from any one person. It just takes a little from everybody. Yes, amen. amen. So we're going to have to break down tonight. So would you stand with me tonight? We'll